My name is Alison Neef, and I'm the chair of the Oxfordshire Mammal Group. And this is our first lecture for the 2023-24 series. And um, so welcome to all you existing members, welcome to new members, and welcome to those of you who've just come along tonight to hear about Peruvian otters. Anyway, it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Claire Moore. And um, Claire is currently doing a PhD in Oxford and um, through Lady Margaret Hall, that's her college. And, um, but she did her an integrated, inter integrated, masters. integrated masters at the wonderful University of St Andrews, where I also went many years ago. And um, during the latter part of the course, she had to do some field work. So she went to the Kalahari Desert, she went to the highlands of Scotland, and then she ended up in Peru and fell in love with these otters. And they have become her passion for work and probably passion generally. And she's going to tell us all about the otters of the Amazon. Welcome, Claire. Thank and you very much. And you've got your own microphone. I do believe so. Oh, and we will tell you at the end what the upcoming talks for the rest of the season are, so you mustn't leave before the end if you want to know that. I've heard some people want to know that. Well, can, you can, what, what? can you dim the lights a bit? So How do we do dim the lights? Is that good enough? A bit more? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Wonderful. We don't want to miss how beautiful my animals are. <laughs> it's really good yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. So, good evening. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you all tonight about this remarkable animal, uh, the giant otter. So, I will be talking about their importance as an apex predator. Uh, their ecology, their behaviour, the current conservation status of this animal and the possible future of these magnificent creatures. And then I'm very happy to answer any and all of your questions at the end of this talk. So a quick introduction to myself. Um, I had a wonderful introduction just there, so I don't need to spend too long on the slide. So I'm currently a DPhil student at the University of Oxford, and I've had the pleasure of working with giant otters uh, with San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance since 2018, when I first started working there. Um, I joined the project during my master's, which I completed, like I mentioned, at uh, University of St Andrews. So along with giant otters, I've also studied an array of other animals, mostly mammals, such as the bottlenose dolphins of the coast of South Africa, jaguars and pumas, which have continued to be part of my DPhil. And uh, I've got to work with a couple of other wonderful and far more cute animals, such as meerkats, uh, throughout my time. So none of my work could have been done without the help of many organisations and people, um, including Panthera, People's Trust for Endangered Species, and San Diego Zoo uh, Wildlife Alliance, like I've mentioned. So um, I'll give you a quick overview of the giant otter's home. A wee bit about apex predators themselves before I move on to giant otters, just so we're all on the same page. So, giant, so the, <laughs> the Amazon jungle is the largest river system in the world, and it's also the largest rainforest in the world. It also is the most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet. There's more plants and animal species in this area than there is anywhere else on the planet. Now, uh, because it is uh, fed by the Amazon River, it means that it has, uh, it's a world of dual environments. It truly is both terrestrial and aquatic. So to understand one, we have to understand the other. The vast numbers of rivers, swamps, lakes, um, and seasonal flooding that occurs in the Amazon means that along with the 390 billion trees that are found in the Amazon, um, you also have drastic changes where you can end up with entire areas underwater. And uh, I can tell from experience that sludging through that can be a wee bit, uh, a wee bit concerning <laughs> at times. So the line between the waterways and the land is blurred and interlinked. Therefore, understanding one environment helps you understand the other. So this uh, helps shape part of my defill. Now, I'm going to also quickly go over threats to the Amazon. I won't hamper on too long since I think we're all probably... Uh, very aware of some of these, if not all. So the Amazon is under threat from many fronts. Uh, extensive mining operations have occurred throughout the forest, leading to deforestation, to pollution. Construction of hydroelectric dams lead to unnatural flooding in the forest, creating issues for both aquatic and terrestrial life. 
It prevents fish migrations, the same way when a dam prevents animals from going upriver. Um, and it also creates unnatural behaviours, including with giant otters. So giant otters are used to living in uh, smaller lakes and uh, river systems. And if you flood a huge area of forest, it totally changes uh, the dynamic of their environment. Building of roads, such as the Trans-Oceanic Road, uh, opens up the interior of forests to uh, you know, more anthropogenic uh, influences, such as more mining and deforestation. And along with the addition of prevalent forest fires, growing agricultural use, and the increasingly bleak issues as a result of global climate change, the present outlook is, in short, very concerning. However, the impacts of anthropogenic activity has only been guessed at. Uh, we try and do a lot of measurements, but uh, simply put, we just haven't done enough as far as measuring things. And I'm arguing that you are able to use apex predators as a way of measuring and investigating this anthropogenic effect, and more importantly, a way of potentially reversing some of the more devastating effects. Right, so now that we've got that out of the way, I can talk a bit more about some of the nicer areas. So Monte de Dios and Nani National Park is the location of the study system that I was working on. So this is in Peru. Um, in South America. Now, uh, Moda de Dios is uh, arguably the most biodiverse park, uh, national park in the world. Um, it contains a uh, huge space of undisturbed rainforest, tens of thousands of species of plants and animals, and uh, further down in the Moda de Dios region, there is a variety of human disturbances present, such as uh, mining and tourism. So the, this has provided my study with natural variation. So when you seek to understand something, such as the behaviour of an animal or the effect of anthropogenic effect, uh, activity on species, you have to have multiple opportunities to study the species with ideally some variation. In a lab, we can control this variable, such as temperature, thus being able to directly control the experiment to examine what we want. In nature, this is a bit more difficult. So as scientists, we have to seek opportunities where natural variation is occurring. Uh, and this allows us to look for comparisons. So part of my study site, such as the interior of Manu National Park, is uh, so remote that typically the research team end up being some of the first humans that the otters have seen. They've got no positive or negative <coughs> experience with us. Um, unfortunately, in areas of the Monte de Dios region, where I work, which is outside the park, uh, there's huge mining operations that have happened, so the otters are very familiar with people and not always in a very good way. Um, this is allowing us to have this sort of comparisons that we're uh, looking for in my research. Right, so, apex of the Amazon. So, you probably are quite aware and familiar with these guys, the felids. So, um, I'm studying apex mammalian predators, which include pumas, ocelots, margays, and jaguars. However, like I mentioned before, when we're looking at the Amazon, we're both needing to understand the terrestrial and the aquatic, which is how I managed to get my giant otters. And that's why I'm studying them. They are representing the aquatic portion. So I will very briefly go for threats to the species because we do get to start talking about my wonderful otters very soon. Um, unfortunately, like many animals, they have been massively devastated by anthropogenic activities. So uh, this is uh, unfortunately a pelt of a giant otter. Now giant otter pelts were actually worth about three to four times as much as a jaguar's pelt. Um, at the height of uh, fashion. They were waterproof, quite soft. Um, unfortunately, things such as the pet trade has continued to decimate numbers of uh, both cats and uh, giant otters. And at present, giant otters are on the IUCN red list as endangered. Now, uh, I will talk briefly about apex predators. Now, who here thinks they know what an apex predator is? Just a show of hands. Okay, excellent. So, an apex predator is basically a predator that has no natural predators. As most species on Earth, uh, it's likely hunted by humans. However, in the natural environment, it has nothing to fear except members of its own species. So, this role has global trends throughout history. Now, uh, we'll begin 
with uh, something that you won't see uh, in your in your uh, beach day typically, but they did used to live in the ancient oceans. Now, the compound eyes of a species that I will struggle to pronounce, Animal Lassaris, I have practiced that, it made no difference, um, <laughs> had compound eyes, which nowadays everyone has a really great working eyes. However, back then, um, it was quite a, a, new, a new piece of evolutionary tech and a man that was able to search out its prey uh, and hunt most effectively. We get to the Mesozoic era and it is a surprise to no one that it is the Tyrannosaurus rex or uh, a dinosaur in general that would be the apex predator. Um, most recent uh, uh, you know, uh, research leans towards it being not a scavenger as much as we thought it was and instead a pack hunter similar to wolves and lions of nowadays. However, mammals nowadays dominate these positions, such as the orca, um, that we're all very familiar with at the moment in the news. So mammals nowadays pretty much dominate the apex predator role within our world's ecosystems. Now, with the roles within ecosystems that apex predators will uh, take place with is basically they will enable coexistence, particularly coexistence of different predator species. So remember when I was showing you all the different felid species that there were, the jaguars, ocelots, the pumas, the margays, the presence of the larger jaguars keep the numbers of the pumas down, keep the numbers of the ocelots down, keep the number of the margays down, two levels where one doesn't dominate another. Now they also control prey populations, and this is primarily just through the fact that they are present, they are hunting, they are eating them. Um, in addition, it also changes the behaviour of prey. So I'm sure many of you will know about Yellowstone National Park. Introduction of wolves created changes in the behaviour of the elk that were present there, which led to changes in the uh, plant life due to a lack of not overgrazing, eventually arguably changing the rivers themselves. And all of this can stabilise ecosystems. The removal of an apex predator in an ecosystem can massively destabilise the ecosystem that it is a part of. Now, I uh, promised that we would get some, <laughs> some cute giant otters. So, let's see if this is going to... I don't know if it's going to make sound. I don't think it is. That is fine, they're very loud, that's all you need to know. So, giant otters are the largest species of otter in the world. They're not the heaviest, that is sea otters, because they've got a wee bit of blubber. At two metres long in length, weighing in at 32 kilograms, they are formidable in the water. Trust me, I have been in the water with them, they are very scary. They're a little less, uh, as you can probably tell, um, formidable on land, due to the fact that they're very long and sausage-shaped. And they live in the waterways of South America, mostly eating a fish diet. However, they can and will consume caiman, uh, which is the other apex predator in the waterways. I have personally witnessed them eating a caiman like a burrito. They, <laughs> they will carry out mobbing behavior in order to attack and take down six meter long caiman if they feel threatened. Um, and they are very territorial. Typically, they live in forest lakes, living in numerous dens that they will maintain, and they'll have campsites, which they use as latrines, and they will use this as a way of uh, communicating with other animals and other otters in the area. So they uh, advertise their presence in that manner. So they have nothing to fear when they're in their groups. Uh, their size makes them unique from a morphology point of view. However, what makes them particularly interesting to me is their social behaviour. So uh, I think we've got a little bit longer of the of lovely videos. Is this people's first time seeing giant otters? Put your hand up if you've seen giant otters before, either on TV in the wild. Okay, so these, these guys are uh, very adorable from a distance. That's <laughs> what I'll say. Um, but they are very intelligent animals and I have a very large soft spot for them. So. I will move on to the next slide. <laughs> so uh, everyone's probably a lot more familiar with Lutra Lutra, the Eurasian otter. That's the one that you'll probably see around at Lady Margaret Hall. Occasionally we can see them, which is excellent. So this is the native species of otter that's found around the UK and other parts of Europe. 
They are solitary, which means they only really come together for mating purposes, and they'll raise their offspring, and then that year's offspring will go away. Other species of otter can be quite social, such as the smooth coat otters, um, and it will vary massively in their, in their socialness from either entirely social to loose family groups. However, the two most social species are again the sea otters, which will adorably hold hands in the water, we've all seen videos like that, and my giant otters, which are slightly less uh, cute looking, however, very social as well. Right, so while people believe that the social behaviour of otter species isn't an indicator of their genetic relatedness to each other, which we can tell because there are very social uh, otter species that are very closely related to very non-social species. Um, it is interesting and important to look at uh, basically how closely related uh, giant otters are to other otter species, in particular where they split off. So this is a phylogenetic tree that basically is showing uh, when animals have split off when they last had a common ancestor. So the last common ancestor for uh, giant otters, again, I will mispronounce this terribly, Terranura resilianus, giant otters down here. You can see that the that the that in this paper, the presumed uh, time that the giant otters split off, last had a common ancestor, was 10.5 million years ago. Uh, this number changes anywhere between 8 million years ago to 14 million years ago, which is a huge time from an evolutionary point of view, and I'm, I'm going to put it into perspective for you. There's about 5 million to 6 million years uh, since we last year in common ancestor. So whenever people are talking about otters, you have to keep in mind that they can be as different between different species as we are to chimpanzees. Um, so a court, and this is according to the, both the fossil and the phylogenetic record. So this would explain differences in maybe behavior, morphology, so the body, uh, as well as intelligence. Now, uh, I'll go back to a slightly depressing uh, topic, their conservation status. Like I've mentioned before, giant otters are endangered. Now, uh, despite the fact that they are a large, charismatic animal, we don't actually have that good uh, 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 a lot of surveys of them, especially in some of their environment that is uh, more difficult to get to. So where I work is Peru, just in this section here in Modo de Dios, on the sort of, uh, on the north, south, east, west. Uh, I am at Oxford, it's terrible. <laughs> so on the west side of the Amazon uh, rainforest. Now the otter numbers, we've got anywhere between 1,000 to 5,000 in the world, which I do tend to lean more towards the higher end of the estimate, but it still unfortunately does put us within the endangered uh, bracket, according to the IUCN red list. Now, again, um, I'm fortunate to be often surveying about, uh, accord depending on what number you're taking, I'm surveying anywhere between uh, uh, 2.5 to 20% uh, of the world's population with some of the animals I'm looking at, which is very cool, but also quite sad. So, animal behaviour. Um, and I've got some wonderful examples, all based with otters. There's a theme tonight. Um, so I've spoken about behaviour of the otters and I've spoken about the importance a few times. But why is behaviour so important, uh, in particular when it comes to studying giant otters? So animal behaviour affects many facets of life and life history. So we'll start off with grooming behaviour. Now grooming behaviour in the immediate moment uh, is great because it reduces parasites. So I, I groom you, you groom me. And this also builds a bond between us. So you're building a bond with me when we're grooming with each other. And this bond that we're building helps with uh, when we're hunting, if we're hunting cooperatively, which there's some science that potentially giant otters uh, hunt cooperatively. Um, in addition, it also means that we're stronger when we're doing uh, cooperative defense. So this is a jaguar that is getting mobbed at by a bunch of giant otters. Giant otters, uh, a group of giant otters would take on a jaguar. Um, and a solitary giant otter would maybe not stand as much of a chance against a jaguar, but together, I don't like the jaguar's chances. 
So studying the otters has provided information on many different areas of life. Just by studying that initial social grooming has knock on effects for other aspects. And looking at another behaviour, parental care, that is an adorable little baby cuddling up against, that could be mum, that could be brother, that could be anyone, they do all parental care. With the behaviour such as parental care, we see the immediate effects on the offspring. Basically, you feed baby, baby lives another day. Their survival rates and their general health of the otters also increases or decreases depending on the parental care. And important learned behaviours. These animals are born very, very useless. They are born blind. They do not know how to swim. They do not know how to hunt. You need to teach them everything. A, a giant otter is very useless before the age of two, which is significantly better than the average human, if I'm honest. <laughs> so... This results in a knock-on effect though, so an uh, increase in survivability of offspring has a knock-on effect with demographics. Basically, if a lot of babies survive one year, then it means the next year there's more uh, juveniles, and then the next year there's actually they're catching their own fish, and then in a couple of years' time they're able to leave the group and go off and perform their own territories and make their own little baby otters. So you can tell that this early behaviour has knock-on effects for much longer term things that can affect the whole species and the whole population. So, observational studies. This is another video. Let's see if this runs. Okay, excellent. So we've got some lovely otters on a lovely log grooming. So, how do I study these animals? Well, it wasn't easy. Um, so, I work, like I've mentioned before, I work with the Giant Otter Project in conjunction with San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and the People's Trust for Endangered Species, and the University of Oxford. So we carry out surveys by going out on canoes. That is my, my food. I am having a break there. This wasn't me all the time, uh, in case my supervisors are watching. Um, <laughs> so we collected data through GPS uh, coordinates, writing out observations, and also taking video footage, which is primarily what I use to analyze the behavior. So whilst this is also very nice for outreach, I quantify a lot of the behaviours that are seen here and then will analyse them. And that's how I end up getting uh, my results. So um, with other species, such as the jaguars, the pumas, the tapirs that I study, I just put a camera trap out in the middle of the forest, check on it every now and again, and then look at the footage. But with these guys, it's a lot more of me following them around in the canoe, getting quite good at rowing. Um, so this isn't suitable uh, if the, it's difficult to find the animal. However, um, the animals are very loud. If you had heard this uh, recording, you would have heard them. I'm hesitant to do an impression because I have a microphone, um, <laughs> potentially at the lamb and flag later. So luckily for us though, their communication skills being so loud means it's quite easy to locate them. So these were some of the study sites I was working in. So the protected areas are within Manu National Park and the unprotected coaches are outside of it. We studied about 25 coaches. Oh, coaches. That's what we call Oxbow Lakes. Now, Oxbow Lakes, uh, if you don't remember your geography, is where the meandering river will meander so much that it pinches off and it becomes a lake on itself whilst the river continues to run straight. The majority of forest uh, lakes um, that are there formed through this method. And these forest lakes are filled to the brim with different types of fish, mostly piranhas, because I've had to do fish surveys there and I can attest to that. Um, and this is the preferred habitat of the otters. So there's huge variation um, in the level of disturbance across my study sites. And uh, the otter current is much higher in places with no disturbance by humans or low disturbance, I should say as well. Now we did uh, over 500 individual uh, studies on different cultures since 2018 and we've also continued to do them up until this year. Now giant otters aren't just fascinating animals to study from a behavioural point of view but they're also rather helpful because they have a very easy identifier. So uh, as any biologist who studies animals in the wild will tell you, identifying animals is one of the most difficult parts. So we have here uh, a jaguar showing off her lovely collar, which can be used to identify the individual jaguar, as well as a uh, location of the jaguar. Here we have a uh, bird getting wee ring. So those are examples of uh, physical 
uh, uh, physical indicators of an individual that you have to catch the animal. And it's, it's this, poor, uh, this poor girl will have been knocked out because it's a bit dangerous to put a collar on a jaguar when it's not unconscious. And the bird will have been caught with a mist net. Um, so these are quite invasive ways of identifying different species, individuals, sorry. And here we have something from a camera trap. Now this is not that invasive, however, uh, something like this is either going to take a person a very long time with a lot of computer programming skills, or if you are computer minded, maybe AI could get it to work. But seeing as I'm not computer literate, I'm very thankful that giant otters just have really nice identifiers on their necks. So it's, it's really handy for me. So this is the group from Cochicasho Biological Station, um, the Cochicasho group, specifically the 2018 group composition. So this shows the neck patterns of the animals really clearly, and you can see the different varieties in the, uh, the neck patterns. Whilst I have their names down here as Cashew 4, Cashew 6, which is on all of my official documents, um, they obviously all have individual names, typically based around the, uh, the uh, neck pattern. For instance, that is Frank Sinatra, because it looks like he's holding a microphone. Um, I'm very imaginative. So <laughs> you'd be surprised that some of the great names have come from these animals. Um, so each of these animals are born with these markings. If you're lucky enough to see a baby when it's very small, you'll be able to see the marking and it stays with them throughout their lives. So using this, scientists such as myself have been able to build entire family trees, tracking all the animals all the way back to the very beginning of their lives. And it's rather non-intrusive as far as other methods, which is great when you're trying to do something like studying behavior, such as what I do. I have to not do that. <laughs> So I've got another video, which is a wee bit of babysitting. And this is uh, giving a bit of noise, but only on this. So, As you can see here, we have a, a, a wee baby just now. And we've got another wee baby who's got a fish that it definitely did not catch itself, by the way. This was given to it probably by the babysitter. Now, um, it's not going to do well with it. It has dropped it, and now it's falling in itself. They're very uncoordinated. And when I said they were useless before the age of two, I really did mean it. Now, babysitting is something we're all probably quite familiar with. Um, we all do it as humans, and it's a form of uh, cooperative breeding. Now, you've probably done it for your younger siblings, for your grandkids, etc. However, the giant otters will also do it. This is not mum. This is not dad. This is an older sibling that is currently babysitting the little babies at Kuchikashi. Um, it has caught fish for the babies, but now it's also trying to eat snack. And as you can tell, um, it's not allowed to eat the snack. This is probably a feeling we've all felt if we've been around small children whilst trying to eat our lunch. Now, um, this is a perfect example of social behavior that I'm really interested in. And I can quantify this. However, right now it's just quite cute. The baby's fine. It's fine if it goes under the water. But... Okay. <laughs> I could watch this all day and... Uh, that is my PhD, so I do. <laughs> right, sociality. So that was a wee introduction to sociality with a behaviour that we're all familiar with. However, the word sociality, um, which I've mentioned before, what is it? What does it look like? It basically is any social behaviour. So that involves multiple members of the same species. Um, so I study it using a social, a technique called social networking analysis which were able to look at the bonds between individuals and the group as a whole, looking for patterns and quantifying the behavior that we see. So I could explain how I quantify the behavior, which is mostly just counting, measuring length. It's quite uh, time consuming. However, it does result in these lovely uh, graphs. Now, uh, as a quick overview of giant otter groups, just to help make this make sense, giant otter groups are made up of a dominant pair. So it'll be mum and dad, and they're offspring from previous years. At least this was the narrative for years. Um, recently, we've done some very cool DNA analysis, as well as some observations that suggest that unrelated individuals, adults, are part of the group. They're not part of the dominant pair, which means that uh, unrelated adult members can join the group, which is absolutely fascinating. I've seen it personally happen at Kuchikashi, uh, where this female here, C10, which is nicknamed Fortunata, brought her boyfriend home 
and mum and dad, C8 and C6, were fine with it, which was lovely. Um, realistically, she's probably going to be the new dominant female. Um, so as a quick explanation of what a social networking graph is, each of these are called nodes, and each of these contain a, uh, each of these represent an individual drag otter. The size of the node represents the amount of self-grooming an individual does. Um, and then the arrows represent grooming from the groomer to the receiver. And the colors represent their social standing. So blue is royal blue for the dominants. Pink is for the babies and yellow is for the subordinate adults. Now, poor C1 does all self-grooming on themselves and gets very little grooming themselves. While C10, who's going to be the new dominant female, she does a lot of, she get, receives a lot of grooming, therefore she doesn't do a lot of self-grooming. Now, this was in 2018, and this helped predict behavior that we saw in the future, which is that C1 left the group, went off, maybe dispersed, maybe got eaten by a caiman. There's options. C10 remained with the group and is going to be the new dominant female. So predictive behavior, so uh, predicting uh, future behavior from current behavior is part of what I'm also looking at in my, my DPhil. And it's very cool. And it's also something you can do with giant otters that's incredibly interesting. I mostly measure grooming behavior. So this would be uh, a groomer, this would be a receiver. And as you can tell, the babies do no, groom, no self-grooming and they don't groom anyone. Um, which is understandable because they're babies and they're adorable. Now, so that's explaining that. So giant otters don't normally show intergroup aggression. So they uh, don't appear to really compete for dominance as far as we've seen. Um, in fact, even if it's two separate groups, all they do is really chorus. They basically just scream at each other um, until one goes away. They're very not aggressive as far as we can see. So um, when a dominant pair does get quite a lot older, typically what ends up happening is one of the dominants dies and the other one just sort of graciously steps down and the new dominant pair will take over the group, but the old dominant will stay. And part of this is the grandmother effect, which I know was uh, advertised actually on the, I believe, museum's Twitter not long ago. It was very interesting. Um, the grandmother effect is where it is beneficial for a group that a female stops reproducing at a certain age because her presence and her wisdom and her care that she can offer uh, the other members of the group outweighs the possibility of having uh, a new offspring brought into the group. And giant otters are one of the species that show this. Other species that show this are elephants, orcas, gorillas, and humans. So this uh, indicates a high level of social intelligence as well, which is very cool. Right, we've got another cute little video and adorable picture, I don't care what anyone says. Um, so giant otters, like I mentioned before, demonstrate behavior called alloparental care. So alloparental care is basically where uh, parental care is exhibited to an offspring from individuals that are not as parents. So this would be potentially grandmom, granddad, older brother, older sister, or totally unrelated individuals. Now, in the wild, this form of behavior is not often seen. It can also be parasitic. Everyone knows about cuckoo birds with cuckoo nests, where an egg will basically be uh, placed into uh, a different species nest, and the baby, when it hatches, will kick out all the other eggs, and uh, the mum will... Uh, Sorry, I'm aware that the babies are squealing. It's just begging for food. It's not really getting anywhere. He'll, he'll figure out eventually. Um, so uh, with giant otters, it's not parasitic. It's not negative. It's in fact very beneficial for them because as you can probably tell, the babies need a lot of food. Um, this guy's only probably a meter long. He's probably from, uh, he's probably about eight months old at this point. Um, and not very coordinated at all. He will require a huge amount of food. And if it's just mum and dad, mum and dad probably will not be able to feed this baby. They need the whole group involved. Um, however, it does mean that you end up with very strong and very smart babies at the end of it. Um, if slightly ungrateful. <laughs> and uh, you'll hear the squeaking noises that are coming from my laptop. Now, 
what I will say is this next clip. Um, here we have some otters coming from land, and that is a baby that is carrying in its mouth. That's how small they are and how defenseless they are. One of the very cool things that giant otters do is they actually do swimming lessons with their babies. And this is done not just by mum and dad, this is done by the whole group. So what they'll do is they will pick up the baby and they will carry it underwater and uh, bring it up to teach it how to hold its breath and when to expel its breath, which is fascinating. Um, and then it'll, they'll also teach them in the shallows, get them used to the idea of swimming. And it, it, like I said, it will be about two years before the animals are able to catch enough fish to support themselves. This, the social uh, dynamics in this group, where everyone is basically helping each other to make sure that the babies uh, are, are uh, getting enough food, for instance. When mum is lactating, she's the only one that lactates. It's not like meerkats where everyone lactates. Um, <laughs> She, she will require a lot of food, which means she's never babysitting. Everyone's just letting mum go out and catch fish, so then she's got plenty of milk. Now, unfortunately, otters are devastated with anthropogenic uh, influences. Um, whilst the, the, the pelt trade is illegal, it still can happen. This is obviously from quite recently. And the uh, number of pelts luckily are going further and further down. However, they haven't quite hit zero yet. Um, now, giant otters have a, a misconception because as you can tell, they, they eat fish. Now, people that live in the Amazon will also be eating fish. It's the most plentiful form of protein you can very easily get without having to go into the forest, which can be quite dangerous, and try and compete with uh, jaguars and pumas for the food. Um, so if you're living in the Amazon, you want fish, you want to have your protein, you will go and catch fish. Now, if you're seeing a giant otter that's very good at catching fish, catching fish after fish after fish after fish, you might decide that that otter is maybe taking too much of the fish that you eat. And if you are trying to keep your family alive, then you might try and get rid of the otter in order for your family to have more fish. Um, we know from studies that the fish that giant otters like eating are very different from the fish that uh, humans like eating. However, um, this took studies and this has taken outreach to try and help with. And then obviously you have the two biggest things uh, that devastate giant otters, which is the building of dams and the illegal gold mining and legal gold mining activities that happen. So this. This is huge gold mining activities where um, they will pump, uh, they'll have these huge pumps that will bring up soil and silt from the uh, river floor. They'll add mercury to bind to the gold that's there, very rudimentary. And this will, they'll then filter out and a, more, a lot of the mercury ends up back in the river. It's, that's called a, cum, a cumulative poison. So it will continue to build up in your body. I probably have quite a decent amount of mercury in my body, which I will not tell my mother, um, due to basically being in this environment. Now, of course, I only spent about just over a year in total in the Amazon. Um, if you're living there your entire life, like the otters do, and the local community, then that builds up in your body. And we've already seen some negative effects in both human wildlife and uh, the ecosystem as a whole from mercury poisoning. Um, in addition, the hydroelectric dams, which are less of an issue in Peru, where I study, but are a huge issue in Brazil. Um, this floods this forest. This, this used to be forest. This is a huge dam in Brazil. Um, if you put all of that area underwater, suddenly giant otters, which we say they're way more at home in the water, they, they, still, need the, they still need their dens. They do not sleep in the water at night. Um, many other animals uh, will be basically flooded out of their homes. Um, both of these aren't just disruptive to giant otters, but they're disruptive to basically any animal in the jungle, as well as any person, if we're honest. So in the study sites I've worked in, there's a couple of different types of anthropogenic activities now. I'm saying anthropogenic activities because some of them are good, some of them are bad, and some of them are just meh. Um, so mining, we'd probably say is quite a bad one. Tourism can be good, can be bad, depending on how it's done. Scientific activity, I would like to say is good overall. However, um, I don't know how quite nice it is just having someone follow you slowly, like Smeagol in the cave with the camcorder. It's very much that, I feel. And it's important to keep protected areas where nobody goes. 
other than maybe the native communities that are in Manu National Park who actually are incredibly helpful, especially the Machuenga. So as you can see, these are different activities that you can be doing um, that can have negative effects and can have positive effects. And that's Pochacashi there. That's where I end up spending a lot of my time. Right, so speaking of anthropogenic influence, um, there have been a couple of papers, including with the authors that I work with, including my supervisor, Adi Barakas, um, where we looked at periscoping behaviour. Now, periscoping behaviour is the behaviour you're seeing up here, where you basically push yourself out of the water. The aim is to try and make yourself look as big as possible to intimidate, and you make a funky little noise. I said I wouldn't impersonate an author. Um, and partly it's to try and see uh, a clear view of whatever the threat is. It's also intimidation. And it brings attention to you. It's negative to the individual, positive to the group. And it's a form of cooperative defence behaviour. Now, what we've seen is that in areas where there is uh, a control, which is basically the areas that don't have any human activity, um, periscoping events are quite low. But what, was, what we were looking at was, uh, was this affected by, uh, by things such as if there's a lot of fishing, a lot of mining, a lot of tourism? And it does seem to affect the behaviour, um, but it's almost that they get used to humans, which is quite interesting. I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to speed it up slightly. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, there are many methods of conservation to help reduce the negative effects of anthropogenic activity with otters. Obviously, some of these are small scale and some are very, very large scale. So with climate change creating issues with all species on Earth, reducing the current trends of global warming should be the forefront. And that's just across the board with any species. Um, however, there are other things that we should be working on. So, for instance, educating against the pet trade is incredibly important. Adorable as they are, they don't make great pets in the long run. They're social animals. They require to be in their homes, and there is only a certain number of species they need to be breeding. Um, in addition, we need to be communicating with people that are reliant on the jungle for their food sources um, and communicating that, hey, uh, the fish that you need and the fish that the otters catch are completely separate and they actually are very beneficial because giant otters keep caiman numbers down and caiman will eat pretty much all fish and people. Uh, caimans are a, a, a big eater of people in the Amazon and they can be very, very dangerous. Um, in addition, they can, uh, they can help with education uh, with tourists and also tourism is a great form of uh, income for people that are living in close proximity to the giant otters. Again, this is a little bit of education that uh, Wild Crew was involved with as well as San Diego Zoo Global, etc. And it was translated into both Spanish and Machigangan, which is the uh, language of the Manu National Park. And it was just kind of helping to destigmatize giant otters. In addition, uh, breeding programs. These are some uh, giant otters that were bred in, uh, I believe it was York uh, Wildlife Park. And you can see that there are three individuals because this, uh, this uh, zoo actually listened to the scientific research that you need multiple adults in a group for successful offspring rearing, which is great. We love it when uh, zoological facilities listen to the scientists. And there have been an increase in the number of captively bred individuals. Now, I will finish up because I'm aware I've run over time. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge all these wonderful people that without, uh, without these people, I would not be able to do the research that I do. And we wouldn't be able to study the animals that we do. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening so much to me talk. And do you have any questions? <laughs> much Claire it was a fantastic talk and I'm going to totally take advantage of the fact that I'm staying, standing here right next to you and ask the first question so you think and uh, yeah um, I was wondering if the babysitters have a particular advantage um, when they babysit so in um, Cape Grand Hornbills for instance the females that do kind of a babysitting apprenticeship are much more successful in breeding themselves do you know if anything like that has 
happened. That is something I'm actually wanting to look at with my details, something that hasn't been looked at. However, from just my general observations, I would say that the female that I mentioned before, C10 Fortunata, when I saw her in 2018, she was involved in babysitting at quite a high rate. And it's almost how I would kind of take it is that it appears that since she's now got sort of a central role, it's a good way of building social cohesion. I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm, that is something I really want to look at, and it's definitely a predictor. So thank you for pointing that out. Wonderful. Now it's your turn, everyone, and I'm uh, going to turn the lights back on. Okay, I will repeat whatever questions you say just for the recording. So yes. Thank you for the talk. That was very interesting. Uh, so I'm curious, it sounds... I got the impression from your talk that the main threats are on lighting and dams. So is agriculture and particularly climate change affecting what is less than it is the other one overall? So that's a very good question. So the question was, is... Uh, it sounds like from my talk that mining and uh, dams are the main sort of uh, threat to giant otters is global warming and what was the other one? Agriculture. And agriculture affecting them. So interestingly enough, one of the main reasons why I would argue that it isn't as much of a threat is if we go back to... Let's... There we go. Excellent. Right, so all of the... So otters are basically limited to waterways. They are terrible on land. Now, when it comes to agricultural work, they most of the agriculture that's done in the Amazon will basically be cutting huge swathes of forest that they don't really want to have intermittent uh, flooding on. They want to they want it to have sort of the um, they they want to be able to grow say uh, a huge amount of. Uh, a certain type of, say, cow, raising cows or something like that, they don't have to worry about the persistent flooding, which means that a lot of areas that the otters need, it isn't as affected. So agriculture is affecting other species, such as the jaguars and the pumas that I study, um, are massively affected by the agriculture. However, global warming is affecting uh, a lot of this area. So global warming is kind of, it's it's like taking a, a paintbrush and just saying that most animals, most ecosystems are affected by this. In places like the Amazon, where seasonality is so important, you have huge extremes of, uh, you know, constant rain compared to absolute parched dryness. Um, and in the rainforest, that's especially important to keep in mind the wet and the dry season. Climate change affects that massively. I've just been in communication. I do some lecturing um, on online to uh, Coach Akashu, and when I was last talking with them, they said that this has been the driest, it was the driest September on record. It didn't rain once at the field station. Normally, you would have at least four or five days of torrential rain just to sort of give everything, and it's affecting things like the fruit production and such like that. And in a place like the Amazon, everything is very much interconnected. So climate change will have, it is having a huge effect. And even if it's not having a huge effect at this very moment, if it's affecting the fruit production, it affects herbivores. So herbivores uh, will affect the predators eventually, and it trickles down um, it, everything from like the nitrogen cycle onwards. So... Uh, basically, yeah, climate change will definitely have a big effect and agriculture will have an effect eventually on the giant otters. So that was a great question as well. Um, a well, I guess part of it is, so I wish I could zoom out more on this. Um, this is Manor National Park and then you've got the river. So in this direction is the uh, roads that are opening up basically huge areas of the Amazon. And with the increase of agriculture, even if you're just saying increase of agriculture, increase of human presence in these areas, that's an immediate interaction. All these are, it's, it's becomes a tangled spider web of uh, cause and effect with these animals. And um, anything to do with anthropogenic influence will unfortunately tie up and affect them. But that's one way. Um, in addition, eventually we're going to, with climate change, if it's not as wet and there's less water that's happening less flooding then what's to stop this area from being uh, exploited by agriculture okay. hopefully we can mitigate that though <laughs> so we have Alison's question like this um, main question is if there's got no natural predators how accustomed are they to you do you get very close to them I can and set in a very short question yeah. what's the typical like um 
lifespan? So the tip of the lifespan, um, so I've got a couple of individuals that are about 14 years, which is about the, the sort of the furthest range. In fact, depending on the research that comes back, which I should get in January um, from the people that are out in the field at the moment, then potentially we've got a new oldest individual, which would be very, very cool. Um, but so we'd be looking at about 14 years. However, um, obviously, some of them don't live nearly as long as that, unfortunately. Um, so your second question was, uh, have they accustomed to you? Have they accustomed to me? Are they fairly comfortable with your presence? So certain ones have. Um, what I'll say is that in places where there's a lot of illegal gold mining and a lot of presence of humans, they don't particularly like me. They don't particularly like any human. They will be, um, you know, will be twice the distance as the from here to the end of the hall. So you know, will be about, you know. 100 meters away and they will just go swimming and it does not matter how fast I roll I will not be able to catch up with them and also chasing them isn't the best way of sort of doing studies so if they're if they're devastated by human presence they do not want to be near me within the within the national parks especially at locations such as Uchikashu where they have they're very used to humans they will recognize faces they will recognize me they will possibly recognise my voice because I, I sound quite distinct compared to everyone else. This the, this this quite high pitched Scottish tone. They'll just be like, "Oh, that's Claire." Um, <laughs> and so I've I found that they are quite comfortable with me, especially when they acclimatise. It's a level of habituation. So we do habituation with other species, but I'd say with giant otters, um, in certain places, in certain ones of these uh, certain sites. They've gotten very accustomed. I have had a, a, an otter swim under the boat a few times where I'm just staying still, being like, I'm not going to move. This is, <laughs> but, um, and it, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful, I'd say, as well. They can get quite accustomed. It's much more preferable than when the humans come close. I'll say that much. <laughs> yes, we have a question over there in the middle. Yeah, um, so you mentioned that you're coming here and you're coming to control areas where they're not accustomed to humans, and then like these like areas where they're very accustomed to humans. How does habituation to you, as you mentioned now, answering this question, impact your results when you're like analyzing or like looking at their social behavior? Because surely that will also change their behaviors. But that does have a huge behavior, so thank you for pointing that out. So I actually take that into account because um, if we're going and surveying the authors, we don't have, if we're going out and serving them for say two or three days, that's not long enough for an habituation. <coughs> that's long enough for them to kind of be aware that we're there, but they, we're just a presence. We're another, we're another aspect of it. Um, for groups such as Legarto, Cashew, Salvador that are used to having humans constantly, whether it's ourselves or other researchers, then the habituation's already happened. And that's part of what I'm looking at. So I'm trying to see whether or not there's changes in behaviour from individuals where we are the first otter, the first people, sorry, <laughs> I'm not an otter. Um, we are the first people that they are seeing. Um, that's one thing I'm looking at versus places where they constantly have humans and the habituation process has occurred. Habituation with any animal will take an extended period of time. Even with meerkats that are much more short-lived, um, you know, it would take a couple of months uh, in order for it to happen. With giant otters, it also takes, I would argue, sometimes generational habituation. So that was a great question. Thank you very much. We have a chance for one last question. And, well, maybe, maybe if it's short one, then last two questions, but that's it. Well, I'd love to Okay, we'll go ahead first then. Um, you mentioned that the offspring kind of grow and there's this kind of cooperative breeding one and then they disperse. Is the dispersal going to be male, female, or is there a physical balance? That is a great question. So the question was, um, with dispersion, is there a, a balance of, is it preferably one uh, gender over the other, such as just male, just female? So originally we thought that it was potentially mostly males that were dispersing and females would disperse later. However, um, simply put, we just don't have enough data on, on a lot of this. It's a lot of the studies that have come from this have been um, 
done uh, in very short term and I've seen arguments for both sides. I've seen arguments that males are more likely to disperse. I've seen uh, arguments that females are more likely to disperse. From my own personal opinion, I do think males are more likely to disperse. However, females are also dispersing quite happily. It seems, I reckon it's more of a personality. So for instance, when I was talking about the female, um, I can't remember what direction, the other direction. Um, so when I was talking about predicting the female leaving, Portina, uh, C1, who is a female, um, she was leaving, and in my opinion, she was leaving because, you know, she was not really as connected as other individuals were in the group, and she was kind of beginning to have a bit of distance. There was also individuals that were part of the group that never did any grooming, that we'd also count as dispersing, um, or like just about to disperse. Um, and they were both male and female. I think part of it is the age. So males appear to be dispersing at a younger age than females. So it's, in my opinion, it's less of a likelihood of who's more likely to disperse, but how quickly they are to disperse. Most otters will disperse um, because you're basically doing a waiting game if you're going to be taking over this territory. If you want to breed, which all animals are uh, basically, typically, are going to be aiming to be breeding and reproducing at some point, um, if you're waiting on your mum and dad, basically, uh, one of them dying in order for you to take over the territory and being able to breed, then you'll be waiting quite a while, especially if mum and dad are prime of their life. Um, so you probably want to disperse. Portinata is one of the older females in the group. So the fact that she's sticking around and she's building all these and she looks like she's going to be inheriting as the new dominant female and she's even brought in her boyfriend, um, you know, she's, she's setting up shop. That, that makes sense um, from an evolutionary point of view, but it could have easily been a young male. I think it's more of a personality and more of a circumstance. It just happens that maybe the males take less time to uh, physically mature enough that they can go off because it's very, <coughs> when you're by yourself, when you disperse, you are typically by yourself, you're typically alone, which means that you're going to be having to move further distances and it could be something to do with the morphology and again, this is something, this is an area that would be really interesting to research because we've seen similar things in, say, meerkats, where it is very much gender-based. Um, however, as I point out several times, meerkats and giant otters are like chalk and cheese. But again, when we only have certain species and certain systems that we can compare, we will compare vastly different systems. Does that answer your question? I'm aware I went on the tangent. I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. Um, one last question. One last question. So, thank you, Claire. It's a fabulous talk. And uh, unfortunately, this is the area of 2018. We were um, So, uh, in terms of tourism, have mm -hmm. you seen uh, when we are, would you consider it being, uh, having a positive impact or neutral or negative impact on the forest? I've seen good and bad. Um, I've seen very, very good uh, tourism occur. Oh, so the question was, um, have I seen good tourism and have I seen bad tourism and whether or not I believe it's overall good or bad? I believe it entirely depends on who is in charge of it. Um, within Manu National Park, all the tourism that occurs is very well regulated. It means that every, uh, every time that you're going out, you are briefed ahead of time. You're with someone who's trained who knows about the animals. I myself have given uh, tours to people um, and uh, it means that the animals are kept at a safe distance, the people are controlled, they're not screeching, squealing and such like that. Um, so the animals are very much non-disturbed. Um, outside of national parks, it becomes a situation where it is the individual that's running the show that basically gets to decide. In some cases, they are very firm, they will not disturb the animals, etc. However, I have been to locations where they have fed came in by hand to try and get them closer for tourists. Um, and that sort of tells you the level of just uh, interference that they'll have on the animals. Um, so I think it, when it comes down to it, more regulations required and ideally within protected parks, having also this is a great source of income for people within the protected parks because a lot of like manu national park honestly the the park rangers i think there was a last time i was there there's about 50 park rangers for you know a park about the size of wales it's huge um they're really they're all doing their best however um so more money going into a park like that would be amazing because they're really doing uh, an amazing job at protecting biodiversity there 
Um, so having more income going into these places where, you know, the tourism that occurs there is very well regulated. The animals are protected. They're the important thing. It's not about how close you can get to a picture to get a selfie with an otter. It's very much a... Uh, these are animals, this is their natural environment, and you get the privilege to see them. And that level of respect and uh, consideration should be at the forefront of conservation. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to see them. Captive breeding programs are very important. There is a place for them. So if you wanted to get closer to them, going to national, going to zoos would be an option. However, that type of tourism where it's well regulated is chef's kiss. We love that. Excellent. Okay, sorry. Again, yeah, another tangent. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's thank Claire once again for such a wonderful <laughs>